Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are going to continue. Get my clicker working. We are going to continue in our series, Galatians Unearth. We are 10th week, I think, into this now, and we are in chapter 4. And last week, we, we actually left off at verse 15, so we're just going to get right to it, and we're going to pick it up in verse 16. And this is what we read. Have I, therefore, become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? Think about that statement for a second. Think about the implications of this statement. Have I become your enemy? We're actually getting to peer behind the veil of the deeper reality of what's actually going on in Galatia. I want you to think about something. we got to lay this whole thing out again. Paul the Apostle, he has the truth of the gospel. He is literally commissioned to bring it to the Gentiles. He goes out to these inhabitants of Galatia. He delivers the truth of the gospel to them. It is marvelous. They receive it. There's an anointing that comes upon them. He's preaching Yeshua and him resurrected. They've actually come into the faith. He's having all this success. It's absolutely amazing. But one of the things that he does is he conveys to them, well, just so you know, there has been a decision made in the council. And that is that as you're coming in the faith, we're not going to trouble you. You Gentiles who, who receive the gospel while still uncircumcised, we are not going to trouble you. You do not have to get circumcised in the flesh. It's fine. And this is the message that went out. And obviously the, the, the Gentiles at the time would have rejoiced. But unfortunately, other men came in behind Paul. And these men came in, and these Pharisees, as we know, they were Pharisees, and some of them may have not been technically a part of the Pharisees, but they came in behind Paul, and what, they, what, what did they do? So I want you to think about something. The only way these Pharisees could have peddled their message to get the Galatians to actually receive it, to receive that statement that unless you're circumcised in the flesh, you can't be saved. The only way to do that is to discredit Paul. The only way to do it is to paint him in the corner as what? An enemy. Someone taking them off the cliff. Because let's be honest, if you look at this situation, as the Pharisees come in, you can, you can almost imagine how this little conversation would went. And the Pharisees come in and, and, and talking to the Gentiles, that's wonderful. You're being grafted into our faith. You're following our Jewish Messiah. This is wonderful. Are, are, did you guys all get circumcised in the flesh? And the answer is, well, no. The Apostle Paul said we didn't need to. What do, you, what do you think the response is? There's only one response. Well, Paul's wrong. See, he's leading you off a cliff because if you don't do this, you're going to die. That is the message that is being peddled. And so Paul gets put in this, this arena, if you will, that he is an enemy. And now he says, have I become your enemy? Really, Galatians, have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. You know, you read a passage like this, and you are reminded. This is a stark reminder. When you go out today, you go out and preach the truth to someone, I promise you one thing, the devil's coming for it. He is going to come for it. You need to understand, his number one enemy is truth. It destroys his kingdom. The truth of God destroys his kingdom. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, Yeshua says. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's power in the truth. You have these supernatural eyes to see what the devil is doing in your life. How he is oppressing you. How he is deceiving you. All of that goes away. His kingdom falls when truth comes on the scene. So he has to come and get the truth. And I promise you, he will. He will attempt every single time to come after it. This is a very, you know, I read Galatians. And I got to tell you guys, you know, the more you get immersed into the word, there's things that start to come into focus. And for me, as I go through Galatians, I can feel it in my innermost being. It is war. This is an all-out war. And you have two sides battling. And the devil is battling after the truth. And those who bear the truth are battling to proclaim it. And you think about the devil and how much he hates truth and how for him to succeed, it has to go away. He has to remove the truth. What did he do in the Garden of Eden? When he went to Eve, did God really say, no, you will surely not die. He had to kill the truth 
for her to accept the lie. He's coming after the truth. So this is just, you look at this, this is just a really, really good reminder. Now, as we continue, and this is beautiful, Paul has been painted by this other, by these, by his own Jewish brethren, who are, who are totally discrediting the apostles as well as himself, painted him as an enemy. Well, this is beautiful because Paul is going to return the favor. And this is what we read as we continue. In verse 17, they, meaning these men that went out and did this, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. Paul comes after them. He comes after their character. He comes after their credibility. They don't have any. Because he reveals something very, very powerful. See, they're not operating from a place of purity, from a heart with a good motive. You think about this in ministry, and unfortunately, this this is something that plagues ministries. See, what these men wanted to do is they wanted the attention. See, they're zealously courting you what? So that it literally says, oh, hang on, let me go back, that you may be zealous for them. That was the whole point, that you may be zealous for them. You think about that, and I mean, you, you read this and you're just like, wow. I mean, these are men that think they're going out. They're, pro- they're proclaiming Yeshua as Lord. Now, how many ministries do you think are plagued with this? Unfortunately, there's probably far too many than we even care to admit. That the underlying toe is, no, it's about me. It's about the pastor. It's about the teacher. It's about the leader. It's about the leader of the Bible study. It's about us. Every time we go out, and you know, this gets scary because when you get people in the knowledge of Torah, now they have all this knowledge. All they want to do is sit down and just spew knowledge so that everyone else can be subservient and you can all look like idiots and know how great I am. I mean, this is a reality. This is plaguing. This is a real thing today. In, in, in all walks in, in the ministry. And this is, this is a humbling thing. It has to be born out of purity. The gospel must be born out of a humble heart, a pure heart, wanting nothing more than my job right here and right now is to get you passionate for the king. To get you passionate, to make you want to change your life, to serve him better, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's our function with each other. God will not share his glory. He will not give his glory to another. Read Isaiah 42. It will not happen. And you think of Paul as he's talking to the Philippians. You know, in chapter 2, it's a really cool chapter in the sense that Paul, he tells the Philippians he has a heart for them. He loves them. And he says he, he has this desperation. I'm going to send Timothy to you. But he's very specific. I'm going to send Timothy because I have no one else who is as like minded as him. For all seek their own. For all seek their own and not the things which are of the Messiah, Yeshua. You think about our flesh. The nature of your flesh is to fall into that trap. The nature of your flesh is to say, no, it is about me. You have to fight it. See, because things get perverted. The gospel is getting perverted by these men. Their motives are wrong. They're perverting the gospel. Uh, Now, as we continue on, we're going to go to verse 18. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always. Of course it is. So Paul just wants to, you know, he's talking about these men zealously court you, but for no good. But then he has to come back and say, well, but wait a second. It is good to be zealous for a good thing. It's good to be finahas. It's good to have that zeal for righteousness. And not only when I am present with you. (laughs) It's Paul's little shot under the bow, if you will. Because what happened? See, when Paul left town, everything fell apart. He's reminded them, you should be in the same state, carrying on with the same gospel that I delivered while I was with you. It shouldn't matter that I left. You should have that strength to continue. And then he says this, my little children. My little children. Paul could not have possibly, and you look in the historical context here, he couldn't have employed Stronger words of endearment for the Galatians. To truly pour out his heart, to to, to liken them to his own children. The the bond between parents and children, you can't measure it. 
It's immeasurable. You parents out there, you know what I'm talking about. The love you have for your children, I mean, that's God-given. It's, it's, it's something you can't even describe. And here Paul is coming out, and he calls them my little children. And this is very Pauline, because read his epistles, read Corinthians. He does it to them. He says I, that he is their father. He calls them their father because he has begotten them through the gospel. In Thessalonians, he actually calls himself, essentially likens himself to a mother who cherishes her nursing infant. I mean, that's pure. And I want, so we, as, we look, as we're looking in this, in this chapter four, as we're seeing this, what we are seeing is Paul's pure heart. It is just the gospel was born out of purity and holiness and not about him, not about building his ministry, not about him building his kingdom, All he cared about was you. All he cared about is the Galatians. Very, very powerful. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Mashiach is formed in you. I like this. He's not going to give up. No matter what is happening, he's coming back. And he is going to fight for them. As a parent would their child. He will fight for them. I would like you to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. I got to be honest, this is the one moment in this uh, epistle where I crack a smile. Because what is Paul talking about? Now I'd like to change my tone? From the very onset, it's been vehement rebuke. I mean, from the very onset, from the very onset in chapter one, he already let them know that he had doubts about them, about their salvation. Read chapter three, read earlier on in chapter four, verse 11. There's no question that Paul, there was no mystery about Paul's concern. Although, I will say this, it makes sense in the context of what we read last week. Because what we read is he finally commended them, reminded them at how beautiful they were to him. How loving they were to him, that they received him even as an angel of, of, of God. Even as the Messiah Yeshua himself. So, can I have higher words of commendation, right? And so now he comes in and now he's going to change his tone again. He has doubts about them. Verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. See, again, the problem is, is the Galatians, they've received the circumcision made without hands. This anointing of the Holy Spirit, the very proof that they have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. But it wasn't enough. See, now they have to go back and they have to get that marking in the flesh to solidify their salvation. And Paul says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He who works, the wages are not counted as salvation. It's counted as debt. You're going the wrong way. But look at what he adds to this. Then he says, do you not hear the law? So you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? How brilliant of a statement is that? How many times has Paul done this in this epistle? See, these Galatians, they think what they're doing is lawful. It's according to the Torah. And he says, you're not hearing the Torah. Powerful. In in, in addition to that, you'll notice, again, worth mentioning, notice Paul isn't doing away with the Torah. The very thing that Paul does time and time again is he goes back to the Torah. And we see it just here in Galatians, but in in all the epistles, he'll go back to the Torah to prove the truth of the gospel. This is what he does. Now, as we continue, Paul is going to make good on this statement. Do you not hear the law? And And I want to draw your attention back to what we talked last week. Remember, we talked about Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. For one specific reason, because of the revelations he was given. These mysterious, spiritual, unbelievable revelations that he was given. I'm going to tell you right now, you're about to experience one of those revelations. The very thing that Paul was given in the thorn in the flesh from is going to blow your mind. It is awesome. And so in verse 22, this is what we read. He begins to get into this. He's taking them to the Torah. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. Verse 23. But he, meaning Ishmael, was of the bondwoman, was born according to the flesh. But Yitzhak of the free woman through promise. So here Paul takes the Galatians back to the Torah 
And he wants to explain to them a very profound and deep reality. And he goes through this lineage of Abraham. And I'll put this up here. And so here you have Abraham. You have two different total. You have Abraham with two different wives. Two different lineages. On, on this side you have Hagar and Ishmael. Which is bondage. And then on the other side you have Sarah who gives birth to Isaac. And that is freedom. And so this is, this is what he lays before them. Now look at what he says next in verse 24. Which things are symbolic? Allegoreo in the Greek. That's where we get our word allegory. In other words, he's saying they're representative. Hagar and Sarah represent something far more profound than what you're realizing. Completely profound. You remember the Maaseh avot Simon Lebanim? Remember the, 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 the traditional Jewish saying, the deeds or the actions of the fathers, they are assigned, they're prophetic for the children. In other words, all these things that happened in the Torah, these stories that are recorded, such as what we're talking about right here, it is prophetic. There is a deeper reality. Paul is bringing that truth to the surface right now. Which things are symbolic? Well, what are they? These are the two covenants. Think about that statement. These are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. You want to talk about a revelation? I mean, you, you read this and you realize Paul is operating on a completely different level. He really is on a totally anointed level. He shows here that Hagar and Sarah, they're representative. They represent the two covenants, two very different covenants. One, meaning Hagar, brings you into bondage. She brings you into bondage. But the other, the other one is Sarah. And she brings liberty and she brings freedom. Who Paul actually says is the mother of us all. She is the mother of us all. I want you to think about Sarah. Her name was changed from Sarai to Sarah because she would be the mother of many nations. She's the mother of us all. Let me take it a step further. If you read the Apocrypha, absolutely fascinating read in 2 Esdras. In 2 Esdras, you read that Ezra, he, and I don't want to go too far into this, but he has this vision that is like Ezekiel, Revelation, and Enoch all rolled up in one. It is awesome. And he's talking to a woman. He's talking to a woman. And he's actually rebuking this woman. He doesn't really know who she is. Literally, as he's talking to her, she turns into a building. He was talking to the New Jerusalem. He was literally talking to her, who in the passage, interestingly enough, is actually called the mother of us all. Called the mother of us all. Yerushalayim. The one above. Now, I want to point out something here before we move on. And it's something in regard to Hagar. Uh, Paul not only says that she represents what we call today the Old Covenant, but he takes it a step further and he actually calls Hagar, or he actually says this statement. She is the Jerusalem which now is. Think about that statement. Hagar, the one that gives birth to bondage, is the Yerushalayim, which now is, right now. You think about, like, just a lot of you have been to Israel, and you've been to Jerusalem, and you've seen it. I mean, it is just interesting. When you go there, that you recognize, you actually look at the landscape. And what do you notice about Jerusalem? It's in bondage. Have you been to the Temple Mount? It is completely in bondage. It's, it's really an awesome thing to be out there. This is one of the things that was rolling in my head as I'm out there. And I was like, whoa, Paul had some insight. Paul knew what he was talking about. You want to talk about being prophetic in this speech, and knowing that he spoke according to the, to the Holy Spirit. Look at this. It's completely in bondage. However, I mean, that's not even my main point that I want to make here. When we look at this passage... Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Yerushalayim, which now is and is in bondage with her children. You need to understand this. You want to really appreciate this? You need to understand this in the historical context. When Paul proclaimed these words, do you know 
The temple of God was fully functioning. It was operating. The priests were in the temple serving. The sacrifices were taking place. The priests were singing the praises of God. The people were flowing into Jerusalem during the festivals. Josephus says that over a million people came to Pesach. Over, to over hundreds of thousands, literally. Lambs being slaughtered. For the event of Passover, people were coming in to pray to the Lord. Do you understand? You take this back into the historical context, it makes you sit down and go, wait a second. What in the world? Jerusalem was operating, fully functioning with its temple, with its priesthood, and with its people flowing into her. Let me ask you something. How in the world can Paul say it's in bondage? How can he make that statement? And, and, and again, think about the context. Paul is a Jew. He is a Pharisee. And make no mistake about it. He has a love. He has affinity for Yerushalayim. He loves it. He went and sacrificed. We know this from the book of Acts. He went there during the festival. His heart was to go there. How can this Jew who loves Jerusalem, run around and say it's in bondage. Do you understand how provocative of a statement that really is? Do you understand how controversial? Do you, how do you think that would go over with your fellow Jews? You run around Jerusalem and say, Jerusalem's in bondage. Not real well. It'd go over like a lead balloon, right? I mean, because it's totally out of, it doesn't make sense when you're standing there in the first century watching this all unfold. Doesn't make sense. So how can he make this statement? Well, I want to begin by saying it all comes down to understanding the difference between Hagar and Sarah. And what I want to do is I want to talk about Hagar and Sarah. I want to talk about the two covenants. Because for us to fully appreciate Paul's epistle to the Galatians, for that matter, the New Testament as a whole, we need to, at least to some extent, we need to have an understanding of what these covenants really are. Because I'm going to tell you, the reality is today, you go out and you, you talk to a, your typical Christian in the church, and you talk to them about what the old covenant is, or, and how, how does it differ from the new covenant. What you're actually going to find is that, typically, Christians really have no idea what the old covenant is or what it isn't, and what the new covenant is and what it isn't. There are elements that they have that are true, that they cling on to, but what you will find is it's plagued with oversimplification. And in other words, what I mean by that, and I, and I say this from experience of having this discussions because I'm fascinated. One of the things when, I, when I, I try to work in as I'm talking to my Christian friends is, what do you think about the new covenant? What do you think about the old covenant? What is that? What does it mean to you? And typically it's very simple. Well, the old covenant was just a bunch of sacrifices. It was a curse. It was law. And as we come to the new covenant, it is no more sacrifice, it's no law. Now, there are elements that certainly are true, but this oversimplification has dramatically impacted church doctrine today. And it's this, it's, this, it's this lack of full perspective, shall I say. It's this lack of full perspective that is causing so many problems. And people's understanding of the new covenant, what it is and what it is not. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. And I want to begin where the Lord began. You know, it's interesting that Paul identifies Hagar as the one that gives birth to bondage and Sarah, the one that's freedom. Well, which one came first? Interesting. Hagar. The, the, the covenant, which represent the covenants, Hagar, that represents bondage, she, she comes first. She gives birth to a child, and it's a total fleshly thing. It's not till later, then Sarah comes on the scene and gives birth to freedom. Well, you just look at the covenants and how they're laid out in Scripture. You have the old covenant, and then you have what we call the new covenant today, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with the old covenant. And we just need to ask some questions. What is it? You know, what, what is its function? What are the terms? What are the conditions? These are things that we need to be familiar with if we're going to appreciate moving from an old covenant to a new covenant, what it is, what it is not. And the first thing I want to do is I want to take you back to the Torah. I want to take you back to the time of covenant. 
back to Exodus 19. And this is the moment where God, he called, well, he delivers Israel out of Egypt. Israel comes to the mountain and the Lord calls Moses, come up to, come up to me on the, on the mountain. I have to speak to you. I have a message you need to convey to the children of Israel. And this is what we read in verse five. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. The first thing I want to point out here is understand this. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. I want you to understand them coming out. The Lord did not bring robots out of Egypt. He brought men and women with free will. He wanted them to be willing participants. And so he didn't need to say, hey, you're coming out here. And guess what? I'm imposing my will upon you. You don't have a choice. That's it. And we're done here. And, and you think about that, there'd be no need for the rest of the commandments. There'd be no need to command them anything because they're robots. This is something critical you need to understand about the old covenant. It was only based upon free will. The will for this party to enter in with them, okay? So Moses, he takes these words to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to the Lord. They agree. They're like, everything that the Lord said, yep, we're in agreement. Let's do this. So when you look at this, you have what? You have, you have, you have two parties are looking to agree. They agree. They're willing to enter into covenant. Jumping ahead to verse 17. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the front of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. What is happening? God is coming down on the mountain to speak his covenant in the presence and in the ears of all of Israel. This is not a Moses thing. This is an entirety of all Israel are going to hear this covenant. And what does he do? He, he relays to them the Aseret HaDevarim, the Ten Commandments. And it's interesting, the commandments were told, according to the Torah, the commandments are written on both the front and back. There are two of them. We know Moses carried them down, one in each hand. When he came down from the mountain, he carried them, one in each hand. They're written on the front and back. And here's one of the very key. You know, all of these things that we're, we're looking at today, we're just kind of skimming the surface. But all of these things we're going to be tapping into as we continue in the coming weeks. They're going to be me more meaningful to you. But one thing you need to understand here is that God's finger literally etched his words that he spoke to all Israel on stone tablets. They were written with the finger of God. Very, very powerful. One other thing that I want to share in regard to this, and this is monumental, and this is going to be very, very powerful as we continue in the coming weeks. But these tablets, the words that were etched, what we call the Ten Commandments today, they're literally called the Divre Habarit, which is to say the words of the covenant. Very important. Let that sink in. The Ten Commandments are identified under Hagar, under the Old Covenant. They're called the words of the covenant. And take it a step further, which we're not going to dig into it today. But in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, he actually says something really, really interesting. That the ministry that was written on tablets of stone, meaning the words of the covenant, Paul literally says that it's a ministry of death. That's going to be really valuable to you. It's going to take this whole discussion to another level as we get to it. He calls it a ministry of death. And you should already know this or be picking up on this because we, we kind of went over this in Romans 7 when we went through there. 
All right, now continuing on in our passage in the Torah. In Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings. Now it's, it's interesting, and this is a, a little bit off topic, but not really. We need to look at this. Here they are, it's in Exodus 20, 18, and it says, all the people witnessed Roim in the Hebrew, they saw, okay? They literally saw the thunderings. This is not a good translation. It's just not. It's, I'm fine with it, but it's, it says hakalot in the Hebrew. And what is that? They saw the voices. Voices. Now, this is where it gets really fascinating. That's, I can't pass this passage up. If you go to the Talmud, the sages record what happened at Mount Sinai. And what they record is they, they said that the people of Israel all saw the voices and you'll notice the lightning flashes, that is lapidim in the Hebrew, torches. So get this, as Israel's at the foot of the mountain, they're looking at the voices and the torches. When the sages record this in the Talmud, they actually said what they saw was tongues of fire. That becomes very interesting when you get to the New Testament and Shavuot, the day of Pentecost, when tongues of fire come down, and it's <clears throat> even more fascinating because what do we know about the tongues of fire? Well, it spoke the great things of God in all the languages of the world. Go back to the Talmud, and what happened in Exodus 2018? The sages will tell you that when they saw the tongues of fire, what they saw is the Lord speaking his Aseret HaDevarim in all the languages of the world. 70 languages of the world, the then, known la <clears throat> the then known languages. This is a really powerful scenario. And all of these elements I'm sharing with you mean a lot as we get next week, as we get into to, to the new covenant. Very powerful. So let's go through this. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings or the hakalot, the, the voices, the lightning flashes, the torches, the lapidim, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moshe, Oh, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. So here, as part of the covenant, it's interesting, Israel terrified out of their mind. They, they want something to be done about this covenant. They want Moses to mediate it because they can't handle the voice of the Lord. It's too powerful. It's too great. How does the Lord respond to this request? Well, this is how he responds in Deuteronomy 18, 17. And the Lord said to me, Moshe, what they have spoken is good. In other words, the Lord, you know, this was the Lord knew that they were going to do this. The setup was right. God wanted this. God wanted Moses to be the mediator. And so what they had spoken was good. God agrees. He absolutely agrees with it. Now, so thus far we look at this, we really have achieved two things about the covenant that we need to digest. Number one, it has a mediator. Hagar, this old covenant, it has a mediator. And we know that mediator is Moshe or Moses. Second thing to think about, all Israel heard the words of the covenant. And those words were literally written with the finger of God, put on stone tablets. And ultimately housed in the, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the, the Holy of Holies within the Ark itself. All right? But there's more. There's more that we got to look at to this covenant. And uh, the next thing I want to pull up here is the temple or the tabernacle, if they're, if they're in the wilderness, the Mishkan or the Beit Hamikdash. And this is what we read in Exodus 25, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone. Now, I love this. This is something you need to digest. Who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. That's absolutely fascinating because one of the things that we learn about the construction of the house of God, where God was to dwell, the dwelling presence of God to be there. Do you know how it was constructed? Out of men and women only who had willing hearts that wanted to give to the Lord. You think about how the house of God is established. It is established not with hearts that are, are moving by compulsion, that are being forced 
forced in a corner that where their arms are being bent, the house of God is built upon those who willingly want to give. Now, this is significant part of this Hagar, of, of the old covenant, this tabernacle and understanding its construction and how it came into being, the hearts of his people, willing hearts, continuing on. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood. Verse 6. Oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set and the ephod in the breastplate. Actually, everything that you went through was of intrinsic value in in that day. Going back over 1400 BC. All of these things were of intrinsic value. And this, the things that were of intrinsic value, this is what built the house of the Lord with righteous giving hearts powerful. Now, as we continue, I want to show you the purpose for the tabernacle, for the Beit Hamikdash, the temple. You need to understand why do all this. And this is the reason, verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary, mikdash, that I may dwell among them. That's the purpose. So as part of this covenant, they're commanded to create a house of the Lord, a tabernacle, a mishkan for them. For one reason, relationship. God wants to inhabit with his people. And you look at it, he wants to dwell in the midst of them. In the Hebrew, that's tavach. He wants to dwell in the middle of them. He wants to be at the center. He wants to be with his people. This is just a revelation of what God's desires are. Relationship. It shows you God is not this distant entity thing with no emotions, with no love or anything of that nature, or anything like the gods that we know about, the false gods that we know about here on earth. He doesn't bear any of those characteristics. He longs to be with us, with Israel. Powerful. You know, the temple is the very expression of relationship. It's the very expression of covenant, when you think about it. Now, moving on, there are other elements that we need to consider that make up a big part of the covenant itself. And this one that I'm going to show you is directly related to the house of God, to the tabernacle or temple. And that is the Aaronic priesthood. Hugely significant. Exodus 28 verse 1. I think this is even in part of this week's Torah portion. Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as Cohen. Aaron and his sons, Nadav, Avihu, Eliezer, Itamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And so we find under this covenant that Aaron and his, and actually his sons and all the sons that would go, would go past Nadav and Avihu and Itamar, it would go past them into the succeeding generations, but they were to minister. They were the ones that were to carry out the temple services. They're explicitly dedicated for this. And you need to understand the priesthood's role in the covenant was monumental. It was, it was huge. The first thing you need to understand is the, the number one thing the priests were to do, they were to teach the Torah to the people. They were the ones commissioned under Hagar, under this old covenant, they were the ones commissioned to deliver the law. We're told by the prophets that the people are to seek the Torah from their mouth. And you read in Deuteronomy 33, they're to be the teachers. So in this covenant, in this setting, this is huge. This is the first thing. But the second thing is, is they were also to make atonement for the children of Israel. I want you to think about how important that is. And it all centered around, of course, the temple itself. But if you do not have priests, Kohanim, making atonement for the sins of Israel, what happens to the relationship with God? It ends. Because sins, we're told in Isaiah 59, sins will separate you from your God. There is no question about it. You need someone to deal with that. You need an answer for that. And the answer was the Kohanim, 
according to the Lord. The Lord set up the Kohanim so that they could continue in relationship with him. Hugely significant. So you have, here you have the priests, they're teachers of the Torah. They're taking care of the temple services, taking ministering in the temple, but even more so dealing with the sins of Israel, interceding on their behalf. Very, very powerful. And then you move on, which also is affiliated with the Kohanim doing their job. You have the sacrifices, all right? You have all these sacrifices under Hagar, under this old covenant that are mentioned. And you have the mincha, you have the, which is the grain offering. You have the ola, the burnt offering. You have the chatat, the sin offering. Uh, what else do you have? You have the asham, the guilt, the trespass offering, the shalamim, the peace offerings. You have all these offerings, all these sacrifices, clearly critically important under Hagar, clearly important under uh, the old covenant. Again, it, it goes back to the priests making atonement. Well, they didn't just go and didn't kill anything. They had to take animals, clean animals, and sacrifice them, whether it be rams and bulls and so forth. This blood had to be shed, had to be shed to keep them in covenant. So just looking at this, this is what we have. We have under the old covenant, we have some very important principles. Number one, the 10 commandments known as the words of the covenant. We have a mediator. We know it's Moshe. We have a temple, the place where God would dwell with them to be in relationship with them. We have the institution of the Aaronic priesthood. And then of course we have the temple sacrifices. These are the five primary key elements of the old covenant of this Hagar. Now, in addition to that, and we could, we could spend weeks on this, but there are many, many subtopics to these five primary principles. Things like land rights and redemption rights, and all these things are laid out within the Torah. You have usury laws, right? And so, I mean, there's all sorts of business ethics, if you will, that are marked out clearly within the Torah itself. You have marriage laws, okay? They're the responsibilities of the husbands and the wives, and they even divorce laws, um, Deuteronomy 24. We have food laws depicting the difference between clean and unclean. You have purity laws, uh, laws of nida. You have all those things. You have instruction for judgments, okay? How that was to be handled. What do you do with the murderer? What do you do with the thief? It's very different. Two different things. They're laid out. You know, what do you do with the kidnapper? They're to die. You know, so you go through all these things. These are subtopics. And of course, one that we've covered recently is the separation from nations. It's very clear within the Torah, within the covenant, that they were not to mingle with the Gentiles. They were separate and a holy people, sanctified by the Lord their God. And so here you have all of these elements that, in, that coincide with those five primary principles. Now, when you look at the covenant, the terms, the conditions, understand something. And this is very important. None of these terms and conditions, guess what, were negotiable. They weren't negotiable. If you didn't like Moses as a mediator, it didn't matter. Then actually Israel, go to Numbers 14. They tried that. Let us select a leader and return back to the land. How'd that work for them? It almost literally got them wiped off the face of the planet. If it weren't for Moses interceding, they'd be gone today. But he did. So you didn't, you didn't get to negotiate these terms. You didn't get to negotiate, well, you know what? I really don't care for my parents. They haven't been that good to me. So you know what? I don't want to listen to the words of the covenant. I don't want to honor my mother and father. You didn't get to negotiate that. You didn't get to negotiate, well, you know what? I don't like the Kohanim. I, I think everyone should be a Kohen. It's interesting because Jeroboam did that very thing, didn't he? Jeroboam raised up, he just priest from, whoever wanted to be a priest could be a priest. So he started re, redefining the terms of the covenant. Did not go well for him. And we could go on and on. You, you, you may not like the day the Lord put the Sabbath on. You might want it on the first day. Guess what? It's not negotiable. None of these terms were negotiable. That's very, very important. In fact, let's remind ourselves of Deuteronomy 4.2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. It's right there in the Torah. There's no negotiation. All right? 
It's simply, if you are willing to obey my voice. Remember the words that he spoke. We are willing. Remember what Israel said. We are willing to do whatever the Lord says. Okay? One more thing. And this is huge that I need to mention in regard to the covenant. The covenant for it to be valid. It wasn't just simply the Lord speaking. This is what's interesting. There had to be blood. That's how it was sealed. This is how it was ratified. This is what we read. Exodus 24, verse 6. And Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. He took the blood of the covenant, the book of the covenant, and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Here it is again in Exodus 24. Okay? And Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So to bind this covenant, the people were sprinkled themselves with blood. And that blood sealed it. That's what sealed, that's what brought this covenant into being. And it's also worth mentioning, you'll find out as you continue, the priests in Exodus 29, you'll find the priests themselves were anointed or They were sprinkled with blood. They put on the right thumb uh, um, and the right toe. And so this is is what happened to the priest. Blood was applied to them to sanctify them and purify them. All right. So looking at all these components, it just kind of gives you a little bit of perspective in regard to the old covenant, uh, or what we'll call Hagar, right? The very covenant that brings forth bondage. Now, what we're going to do next week is we're actually going to start carving out the path and looking at Sarah. And then as we go, all these weeks, as these coming weeks, all these elements that all they, I just laid them out, and we didn't really get to get into them today. But as we continue, we're going to be drawing from this so much. And we're just going to bring this together. It's going to be a really beautiful thing. Very informative, very helpful, especially as you're going through and you're reading all sorts of things in Scripture, what this is going to do. With a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding of the old covenant, what it is, what it isn't, same thing with the new. It's going to start connecting dots for you. And you're going to find how cohesive and how clear Scripture really is. Um, So many people think it's just the opposite. So with that, uh, we're going to...